Thank you, worship team. We, again, are so excited that you're with us online. If you've got your copy of God's Word, I want to invite you to turn to Colossians chapter 2. We're going to be there this morning as we continue reading through the New Testament. I have a confession to make. I love coffee. I love coffee so much, I have coffee every day. I have at least two cups of coffee in the morning. And I didn't used to love coffee, but when I brought my firstborn home from the hospital and he decided he wasn't going to sleep for two and a half weeks, I learned how to drink the sweet nectar of life. And I realized why so many people drink coffee. But the truth of the matter is, I don't just like coffee. I like coffee plus creamer. I like creamer so much, my wife looks at my coffee and she goes, that's not coffee, that's coffee milk. And and now when I say creamer, I'm not talking about milk, I'm not talking about half and half, I'm talking about good flavored creamer. I like coffee plus creamer. And so if you think about it, I don't just like coffee, I like coffee plus. You know, I imagine most of you who are online with us this morning like Jesus. You like Jesus every Sunday. You like Jesus on Wednesdays when we're meeting. You may even like Jesus enough to meet with him every day in your quiet time. But if we're going to be honest this morning, if we're going to really dig in today, I think most of us struggle with Jesus plus. The truth of the matter is we love Jesus. We, we sing about Jesus and we want to honor him with our lifestyle and with our obedience but often we're lured in and we're trapped with the idea that we can't be fulfilled and satisfied with just Jesus. Often our lives are leaning into Jesus plus. Even though we may have Christ, we're looking for other things to fulfill us. Sometimes that's philosophy. Sometimes it's self-help books. Maybe it's a, a very successful career. Jesus plus more vacation time might bring satisfaction. Jesus plus kids who obey you and do well in school and sports will bring you fulfillment. For some people, Jesus plus a lot of religious activities brings to their heart uh, a desire of fulfillment. And the truth of the matter is, often, if we're really honest again this morning, it's Jesus plus sin. Sin begins to creep into our life, and we realize that we are not following just Jesus. We're looking for other ways of satisfaction. And so Paul affirms that what we really need, we already have, that in Christ, you are complete in him. Now this tension, this struggle was a struggle for the church at Colossae, that, that many times they understood that they should follow Jesus, but the culture and paganism creeped in, crept into their church and began to speak this untruth that they needed more, more of this and more of that. And the problem for them was that they began to listen and they began to live this very a different lifestyle. And so Paul looked at them as a church and said, the gospel that you are living out is not, in fact, the true gospel. For the gospel is not a concoction of of a little bit of this philosophy and that philosophy plus the teachings of Christ. The gospel is a single substance, and it is the life, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. But the people and the believers at Colossae were beginning to be tempted to add And so Paul writes to the church, and he says uh, several things related to this addition to the gospel. He reminds them, hey, don't relapse back into paganism. And then he warns them not to fall to be inside a relationship and, and, and a concept for other religions and mixing together this idea of Jesus is okay, but I need philosophy and Jewish tradition and, and paganism. And we call that syncretism. When we push more worldviews together to create something new. And that's what was happening at the Church of Colossae, and that's what's known as the Colossian heresy. And so to guard them against this, Paul writes, and he reminds them, hey, don't fall back into the old life. You've already been brought out of darkness into this kingdom of Christ. And he reminds them, hey, be careful. Watch out for those empty deceits and philosophies that are coming your way. And make sure you put your whole heart into believing the full sufficiency of Christ, that he is the preeminent Savior. None are greater than he. And so Paul reminds them, and that's why he writes the book of Colossians. But I think, unfortunately, we can read this book and think, oh, it's an old book. 
but there's so much truth for us today as modern Christians. I believe that we too kind of are stuck in some heresy, that the modern day Christians are being influenced to believe that Jesus is great, but he just isn't enough. Jesus plus something else leads to a lesser gospel. It leads to a lesser Jesus. It reduces the sufficiency of the life and work of Christ, and that's dangerous. We will be running our whole lives looking for that kind of contentment, realizing all along we have shamed the gospel. So the challenge for us is to listen to Paul's instruction here and avoid a Jesus plus life. He's going to give us a warning, he's going to give us a reminder, and then he's going to give us a way. Join with me in Colossians chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 6. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him rooted and built up in him and established in the faith just as you were taught abounding in thanksgiving see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to christ for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority in him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Verse 13, and you who were dead in your trespass and in your uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands, This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. We begin to understand how to avoid a Jesus plus life when we are careful of our captors. When we're careful of our captors. This is the warning. In verse 8, Paul says, see to it that which means to look carefully, watch out for, beware. Look, guard your mind and your heart against those who are coming. There are captors seeking to take you in to captivity. And this idea of being taken captive is a military term, and and it's really meant to be carried off as plunder. It, It would be as if an army would overtake another army, and that victorious army would take off all the treasures of war. And Paul's kind of making an allusion here to the church at Colossae saying, listen, don't allow philosophers and the culture and other things to come in and take you captive by their empty deceit and by their philosophy. Be careful. Watch. Be on guard. Look for those who are coming. It's a very active reality. It is not a passive one. And this idea that that they're coming for you is not a single attack. The Greek structure here reminds us it's a continual reality. And so the idea being, Paul says, beware of the ones who are continually going to attack you. You have to be on guard. And what are they attacking you with? Well, they're attacking you with philosophy and empty deceit. Tricks and lies to kidnap, not necessarily your body, but your ethic, your worldview, your belief system. And he describes this philosophy as human as elementary, as not of Christ. Human in that it's man's quest for truth, what they can kind of make up in their own mind. It's, it's elementary in that it's an attempt for truth, looking around at the world and what they can use of the world to provide truth. And we see this play out in astrology, a very common day that they would look at planets and stars and, and begin to think that those planets and stars were a way of life and a way to make decisions. And Paul says, be careful of that. That's empty. It's lies. It's tricks. And then he reminds us that it's that, that, that according to not of Christ, there's a concept that they're not Christian. The philosophies of the day are anti-Christian. Man's desire to be his own God, to make up his own truth the way he'd like to, that fits his own need. And so Paul is saying, listen, stand guard, believer. There are those who are coming for you time and time again. They want to kidnap your ethic and worldview and call you to believe that Christ is not enough. And here's how they do it. I I think it's happening all over the country, quite honestly. And I'm worried, but I think it happened most 
on our high school and our college campuses, where, where we've got students who are being attacked for their faith in our post-Christian culture. And they're being attacked because those Christian students don't believe in the ethic of the day. You see, often students are kind of lured into this idea uh, of being socially active and, and engaging the truth and the help of others. But on colleges, campuses, college campuses all across America, we're seeing Christian students leaning into that and realizing and believing that Jesus is not enough and that they must believe into a new ethic, a new morality, a new standard of life. And we're finding Christian students begin to believe in political bias and social mores and what's hip, what's right to other people rather than what's right according to God's word and what's right according to the scripture. Our students are being held captive. And the truth of the matter is they're not ready for the onslaught that's coming their way. They're not able to recognize heresy for heresy. They're not able to see the difference between bad theology and good theology. And they give in to that pressure and that temptation. And it may be realities like a worldview or an ethic, or maybe our students are giving in to sin. They've grown up their whole life in a church, but because they've not made their faith their real own, they find themselves falling away, being lured into sin, and, and therefore their young adult life is marked by disobedience. A generation of students are lost to this idea that Jesus is not enough. Jesus is enough. Jesus is all we need. And Paul starts this idea of helping people avoid the Jesus plus life by reminding them, you've got to watch out and be careful for all the things that are coming your way, whether it be sin, whether it be philosophies, whether it be different kinds of truth that are coming from different places around your life. You have to be careful to make sure that you're not contaminating the gospel, that you're living a life of fulfillment and contentment with just Jesus, not Jesus plus. I love what Paul says to his protege Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Oh, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. And that's exactly what Paul is encouraging the church here to do. And I think it's what he's calling us to do. Don't swerve from the faith. Be careful, entrust it, hold on to it, because there's going to come attack your way. So there is a warning with the idea of being careful of our captors. But not just a warning, there's a reminder here. How do we avoid a, a Jesus plus life? We need to be reminded that we are complete in Christ. Be reminded that we need to be complete in Christ. Don't just watch, but move your heart to a belief that you need nothing more than Jesus. Now, what's the best way to do that? Well, Paul, in his great wisdom by the Holy Spirit, elevates the person and the deity of Jesus. There is no one greater, no one better, no one higher, no more, one more perfect than Christ. And so Paul here reminds them that Jesus there in verse 8, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. What that means is all of God is in the person of Jesus Christ, and therefore he is supreme. He is full. He needs nothing else. Paul's kind of building on the argument that he started in chapter 1 in verse 15. Paul says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is in the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Paul goes to great lengths to remind the church of who Jesus is. And that we need to remind ourselves that we are complete in him. That Jesus, because of who he was, is the greatest. The idea that he is preeminent is the idea that he is supreme. No one is greater than he. He is before all things. He holds all things together. He's the beginning and the end. And I love this truth that Jesus because of his greatness, is all sufficient. 
Paul mentions this as sufficiency of the gospel and in Jesus here in Colossians and in Ephesians and other places in the New Testament, I think we need to be reminded of that truth. But here in verse 10, he reminds us of what that looks like, that not only is Jesus supreme and complete, but because we are in Christ, we too have the ability to be filled in him. There's a, there's a wordplay that's going on here. Just as Jesus was fully God, believers are fully in Jesus. And being filled in Jesus makes us complete. We're not complete by our works. We're not complete because of, of who we are or what we've done. We're complete because we are in Jesus. Jesus lacks nothing. Because we are in Christ as believers, we share in that completeness. Completed in Christ. We need to be reminded of that truth. But the problem is, we don't rest completely in being completely complete. I'll say that one more time. We don't rest completely in being completely complete. I find that a lot of people in the churches are somewhat manic, looking for the next best thing to try to fill this void in their life. They are in Christ, but somehow they've forgotten that they are complete in Christ. You know, I think about this truth with a little illustration that many believers find themselves being in Christ, and, and they've realized that they were full in Christ. And we see that at salvation, that Jesus comes and he takes away the sin of our life, and he renews us, makes us whole, makes us complete. But over time, somehow, we've allowed our mind and our heart to believe that we're no longer full, no longer satisfied. So what do we do? We think, if I could just have more success, I'll be full, satisfied, complete. If I could just do more things and, and be more, uh, have more money, or I'll be successful, be fulfilled, be complete. Truth is, we can find the next best thing, all we want. But Paul reminds us that those are empty lies. And we can be hurried around, and we can be frustrated, and we can give a lot of attention, time, and money to these things that will never fill us. Paul says, listen, we are complete in Christ. And be reminded of that truth, that wherever and however that fullness you have forgotten, remind yourselves that you were full in him. It is that fullness that helps us keep our faith firm. It's that fullness, that complete idea that helps us move forward in our faith. And forget that we need something else in addition to this life in Christ. Second Peter 1 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and for godliness. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his great riches. You know, Paul mentions how we're complete in him. He mentions that we're complete by circumcision. This identity. Our identity is made new in Christ. We're complete by baptism, that he brought us out of death, out and into life, that we were buried in our sin, but then raised to walk just as Christ was in newness of life. That we're complete by our forgiveness of our sin and the redemption and the power of the cross. We have been made complete and we need to be reminded of the supremacy of Christ and the sufficiency of the cross and rest completely knowing that because Jesus is complete, we are as well in him. So there's a warning, there's a reminder, and now there's a way. If we're being careful of our captors, if we're being complete in Christ, we then need to be committed to Christ. Be committed. What is the way? How can we make sure we're not living a Jesus plus life? Be committed to Christ. And it really starts back in verse 6. Therefore, as you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. You know that word, that phrase, to walk in him, means to live out your day just like him. It means to, to model your behavior like Jesus. It is the idea that every day I'm surrendering to the idea that I'm going to walk in Christ, not walk in self. 1 John chapter 2, 6 says, The one who says... He abides in him, ought himself to walk in the same manner that Jesus walked. So to walk in Christ is a significant daily commitment. 
And I love what Paul does here. Paul doesn't just tell us, hey, walk in him. He tells us how. How do we walk in him? Well, we walk in him when we are rooted and built up. Rooted and built up. What a great idea that, that Christ in our life with him calls us to be deeply rooted in him. That we get our nourishment for our soul, not in other things, but in Christ and Christ alone. The idea that we should be deeply rooted is a great concept to help us be firm in our faith. You know, I was thinking this week as I was preparing for our message, and much like you all, I have a very busy home, and it was late one evening, and uh, all the children were up, and, and it was just really loud. I needed to take a walk, and so I took a walk outside, and Walk down, I have a long driveway, walk down my driveway, just kind of thinking about this passage and praying for our people and kind of looking up at the stars. It was kind of this moment I had and I looked down and I was reminded that every large or long driveway or sidewalk has these joists in them. My kids call them the line. And those are meant for expansion. Make sure that you've got a place for the concrete to expand or contract depending on how hot or cold it is outside. And I thought to myself, you know, I looked down, and, and I, like you, maybe have some grass in those joists. Look down, I had a little grass that had grown up in those joists. And I thought, you know, for a little while, that grass is probably okay there. But the longer I keep that grass there, the deeper that root's going to be. And the deeper that root's going to be, the stronger that grass is going to become. So strong, in fact, that it could threaten the very integrity of that concrete. I hope that your faith is as rooted so deep that it can withstand anything that might come its way. That it's stronger than what you may think. But it won't get there unless you make a commitment to be rooted. Let your soul be nourished by Jesus, not by these other things the world's trying to offer. So we walk in him, how? By being rooted, but also by being built up. And this is a great illustration for us, the idea that we need to build our life to look more and more like Jesus. I think about my sons who used to play Legos. One Lego by itself is just a, a colored block. But several Legos built upon one another begin to take shape, and you begin to see something, a plane, a truck, a train. For us as believers, we've got to take the blocks of our faith and begin to build upon him each day that we'll look more and more like Jesus. We do that when we know Jesus, and we know Jesus when we look to his word. Acts chapter 20, verse 31 says, By studying the word of his grace, it will build you up. 2 Peter 3, 18, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus. Ephesians 4, 13, And you'll become to experience, you'll come to a place where you'll experience the fullness of Christ. So what building blocks are you missing in your life to look more and more like Jesus? Being firmly rooted in Christ and growing up in him results in a faith that is established and firm. Now let's be clear. You don't establish and firm up your faith. That's the work of God in your life. But when we're finding ourselves walking in him, committed to him, being rooted and built up by him, the result is God's going to do a work in us. And so when the philosophies and the sin and the temptation come our way, we're not threatened to think that Jesus is okay, but I need more in life. We're coming to a place where it's just Jesus. And that's what God does as we're establishing and firm in our faith. Well, how do we apply today? Three simple ideas this morning to help us apply Colossians chapter 2. One, study the word. We know this. But I find myself, when, when I'm wanting something else to bring satisfaction to me, it's because I'm not studying the Word. It's because I'm not walking in Christ like I should. When I find that my heart is wandering and that I see the temptation and I'm lured in to sin, it's because I'm not walking in Christ. I walk in Christ when I'm studying His Word. And how do you know how to become more and more like Jesus? Well, you've got to know who he was and what he did, both as God the Son, but also God the Father and Holy Spirit. I want to challenge you to, to really study the Word. I think another application point in studying the Word is when the more we study, the more we recognize heresy for heresy. The more we see false philosophies, the more we understand that there are people out there who may look like they've got it all together, 
They may have written dozens of books, pastor very large churches, have great podcasts and a huge following, but they are heretics. Thinking that you need to add something to Jesus is heresy. The more you study the word, the more you recognize good theology from bad theology. Study the word. Search your heart and ask where in your life have you been held captive? Where have you believed the empty deceit? What habits in your life are present that you know are not of Christ? What priorities in your life that you know are priorities because you want that fulfillment? You want that satisfaction. And they threaten your allegiance and your concept to be firmly completed in Christ. As you seek the Lord, ask him to reveal to you where and how you are living a Jesus plus life. And last I say this morning, surrender. Surrender to the idea that you are complete in him. Jesus is supreme. His work is sufficient. Stop trying to add that to you, something else to your life. Surrender to that complete concept that Jesus is supreme and that in Christ you too lack nothing. Now, it doesn't give you a free pass to do what you want. The more you walk in Christ, the more you want to be like Christ. But what it does, that surrender puts you at a great space, leaning back in to who Christ is and his sufficient work on the cross. Nothing else is needed. Nothing else is added. Someone years ago reminded me that Jesus plus something has no value. It leads to discontentment. But Jesus plus nothing is everything. Rest there. Surrender there. Jesus plus nothing is everything.